everyone. My name is Katie. Um, just for anyone who is their first time at Bright Club, there is a rule for first time performers like myself, um, mandatory waiting period of four minutes before heckling or throwing objects at the stage, <laughs> please. Um, so I am a mechanical engineer. Please don't hold that against me. Um, there's a lot of stereotypes about engineers. Many of them are very unfair and very harsh, and lots of them are extremely accurate. Uh, you ever try having a house party and invite a bunch of us engineers to it uh, for a housewarming? And we're the people who are in the kitchen. We're opening cupboards, checking hinges. We're like kicking the walls. We're like, check this. Who installed those windows? Like, ah, oh, cowboys did. So it, that's, it's, and it's not, we're not trying to be annoying. It's just we have this insane curiosity about everything. We want to know how things work, why they work like that, who designed it, how could I do this better? And that curiosity for me has brought me to work at Engineers Without Borders. Possibly will be renamed Engineers with Some Borders, Ireland. Um, <laughs> but we'll see how the next few weeks go. Um, so most people don't know us, but you might know Doctors Without Borders. So a very similar concept, sharing skills and resources um, all around the world for people in need. Um, we are not doctors, though, and you don't want to confuse us. You do not want two engineers <laughs> looking at a patient like, oh, this one, what's... What about these kidneys? I, oh, they're not really working anymore. Should we, can we fix this? Can we repair this? I'm like, gosh, honestly, this is the second time this year. There's a couple of other bugs. It's, it's not responding to the latest updates. I just, <laughs> just, I say we scrap this model and go get in a new version. Um, so when we're not failing at being doctors, um, we try to bring sustainable engineering solutions to some of the most vulnerable communities um, in different, all over the world, at home and abroad. Um, whether for us that could be something like infrastructure, building houses, building roads, bridges, it could be to do with healthcare, it could be to do with clean water and sanitation, or bringing electricity and energy and the internet to really remote regions. We provide our skills, our problem-solving skills, as a resource for these communities to deal with really, really specific challenges. Uh, a lot of the aid sector uh, has this, is still operating on a really traditional donor and beneficiary model. So it's not a partnership. It's people in offices hundreds of miles away making decisions, where the money goes, what project happens next. And far too often, it doesn't include the voices of those people who are living with those challenges. And I mean, I get it, I understand. If you're a funder, you're putting the money in, you want those sexy results and those outputs. You want to say, we built 20 schools, we put in 100 wells. You want that photo up at the end which has children like dancing around and playing at a new tap that's just been installed. And all of these things are done with the best of intentions. But good intentions are not good enough. So one example is a, the play pump. Uh, this is like a kid's merry-go-round, a roundabout, which brings, as children are playing, it brings water from underground up into a big tank uh, overhead, and it supplies water to the whole community. Uh, brilliant idea, in theory. Uh, but whoever did their calculations forgot to carry the one. So it turns out you would need to operate the play pump for 27 hours per day to get enough water up. Now, I don't know about you, I've tried to fit 27 hours into one day before and without success. Uh, but that's not even playing anymore, that's just basic child labor. Uh, the scariest thing about this project is they had raised uh, 60 million US dollars in pledges and funding even before their pilot study was completed. Why? Because people love the idea. People love the idea of a great, positive, simple solution. It's like we've solved poverty, tick the box, great. <laughs> Uh, the unfortunate thing is poverty isn't simple. It's really complex and it's really messy. And any sort of solutions need to reflect that. Um, here's another one for you. Did you know that 82% of all statistics are made up? <laughs> That's not true. But a real statistic, which is true, is that over 55% of water and sanitation projects fail within the first five years. And that's an average. So some countries, that's as high as 70 to 80%, which is insane. It's ridiculous. I can imagine that in any other industry for infrastructure. You get handed keys to your new house, which has just been built. And someone's like, yeah, 
should be good for like three or four years and then, pff, I don't know, the walls might fall down. Yeah, uh, lol. Uh, why is it like this? Again, it's the charity sector. It's really challenging. There's Funding is really hard to get. Timelines are really short. And there's all these different challenges. So external organizations do the best that they can, but a lot of the time they're making lots of assumptions to get those projects done. And assumptions are so dangerous. I mean, I grew up in Ireland in the 80s and 90s, and every year you got your troker box to collect money to help the poor black babies in Africa. That's literally, that's the single story that you get. Uh, more recently, I lived and worked in Kenya, and again, you see how that, uh, those stories affect people. My friends are like, how are you getting on? You know, how's the food in Africa? I'm like, oh, well, okay, I actually live in Nairobi, the capital city. It's got three million people. It's got bars and nightclubs and restaurants. There's this amazing startup culture. There's huge innovation and such a great tech scene. Their mobile money stuff is way better than anything we have going on here. My Wi-Fi was a hundred times better than Wi-Fi at home in my parents' house here. It's crazy. Well, people don't know that. They don't hear those stories. Like uh, one great one, there's a recent invention of these smart gloves. Sorry. Um, and they recognize the movement of your hands. So a person who, a deaf person can sign sign language with their hands and it converts that sign language to audio speech. So if I'm a deaf person, I can communicate with complete strangers who can't speak sign language. And that's not coming out of Silicon Valley. That's a guy in his 20s in Kenya who invented that when he saw his niece struggling with it. Like these kind of amazing stories. This girl from Mexico developed a solar heater out of recycled materials. It's amazing. Like for me, Nairobi was such a wake-up call of all of those assumptions and all the times when I was wrong, especially as an engineer where you're told you're the expert, you're brought in for your knowledge and give your valued opinion. But I'm not an expert on living below the poverty line. So it's so important for us as engineers to listen to those people, listen to their stories and start to break down those stereotypes, like the stereotypes about engineers, they're a bit flat and one-dimensional. We want to fill that with all the really, really interesting, diverse, crazy, wild innovation stories. Start, any one of us can do that. You don't have to be an engineer to start building bridges between people and cultures. And I promise you, I will not come looking for a structural integrity certificate for your metaphorical bridge between <laughs> one culture and another. I, you can do that here. Make friends with strangers when you travel. Make friends with strangers in Ireland. If you do park runs, check out uh, sanctuary runners. They link up with people living in direct provision centers. So there's all these little ways. So just keep an open mind, keep listening, and keep sharing stories. Yeah, I've been Katie without borders, so <laughs> it's been great. Enjoy your night. <laughs>